And so I've titled today's message, Sneaky Scammers. Sneaky Scammers. And again, Joshua chapter 9 this morning. An anonymous wit reminds us this. And this, I read this and I thought it was, thought it was pretty funny. A dentist's mistake is pulled out. A lawyer's mistake is imprisoned. A teacher's mistake is failed. A printer's mistake is corrected. A pharmacist's mistake is buried. A postman mistake is forwarded. An electrician's mistake could be shocking. The novelist Joseph Conrad wrote, it's only those who do nothing that make no mistakes. Well, as we'll soon see as we go through this chapter, doing nothing was Joshua's mistake. Now, back when we covered chapter 7, we learned that the main factor in Israel's defeat at Ai was their failure to consult with the Lord, their failure to come to God and ask him, what should we do? How should we proceed? They were on their own program, and they did things their own way, and as a result, they were utterly defeated by a lesser army, by a more uh, weaker army, weaker people. So you think that they would have learned after that defeat that the only reason that they were only able to make a comeback and beat AI was because they sought the Lord. But what we are about to discover is that even after hearing the law of God read to them at Mount, Mount Ebal and Jerizim, and even after recommit, recommitting and renewal, uh, making a renewal in their willingness to obey God's word, they still overlooked the importance of seeking the guidance of God. See, although the events of chapter 8 was a time of spiritual victory, Satan used that time to find a weakness for a subtle attack. So here's what I'm saying. When God's people think they have it made, they're most vulnerable. That's when they're the most vulnerable to the enemy's assault. Now, this entire story, this story about the Gibeonites, will encompass it, it, it takes up chapters 9 and 10. Now, I don't have all the time in the world, so today, this week, I'm just going to be covering chapter 9. But chapter 9, that, this chapter we're going to be covering today, will tell us how Joshua and the men of Israel allowed themselves to be deceived by the Gibeonites to form an alliance with them. And then next week, when we get to chapter 10, the story will go on to inform us that that mistake would eventually turn into a great victory for Israel. Now, the lesson from Joshua's inaction that we're going to learn, that we'll, you're going to read about, will help you as a believer, as a Christian, to remember why, as a believer, why, as a Christian, we must do our due diligence before we act. We must, as Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you the path to take. Again, the importance of coming to the Lord in prayer before any decision is made seeking his guidance. 
And so before we get into the first part of our passage, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have us here. We are thankful that you've given us life, you've given us breath, you've given us a heartbeat. Our, our lives, everyone's lives, is in the palm of your hands. Lord, we just want to, we trust you and that you know what's right and what's good and believe you and know that you have great and wonderful plan for your children. So now as we get into your word, into Joshua chapter 9, I pray that what is being read here, what is being said here will minister to those that are here, will minister to those that are watching. You will speak powerfully to them, that you'll speak powerfully to those here, as a church, and that you also speak powerfully to each individual person that's sitting in these seats, that's watching this video now, live, or later on, or hearing it later on. You will move, Lord, because that's what your word does. It changes lives. It transforms. It saves. So again, now we just sit at your feet. You now hear what you have to tell us. Keep this room safe. Keep us all safe. Remove all distractions. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, Joshua chapter 9, verse 1. The Word of God says, when all the kings heard about Jericho and Ai, those who were west of the Jordan in the hill country, in the Judean foothills, and all along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea towards Lebanon, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they formed a unified alliance to fight against Joshua and Israel. When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they acted deceptively. They gathered provisions and took worn-out sacks on their donkeys and old wineskins cracked and mended. They wore old patched sandals on their feet and uh, threadbare clothing on their bodies. Their entire provision of bread was dry and crumbly. They went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, we have come from a distant land. Please make a treaty with us. The men of Israel replied to the Hivites, perhaps you live among us. How can we make a treaty? Perhaps you live among us. How can we make a treaty with you? They said to Joshua, we are your servants. Then Joshua asked them, Joshua asked them, who are you and where do you come from? They replied to him, your servants had come from a faraway land because of the reputation of the Lord your God. For we have heard of his name and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two Amorite kings beyond the Jordan, King Sion of Heshbon and King Og of Bashan, who was in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our land told us, take provisions with you, for the journey, go and meet them and say, we are your servants, please make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we took it from our houses as food on the day we left to come to you, but see, it's now dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them, but see, they are cracked. And these clothes and sandals of ours were worn out from the extremely long journey. Then the men of Israel took some of the provisions, but did not, and here's the important part, did, they did not seek the Lord's decision. So Joshua established peace with them and made a treaty to let them live, and the leaders of the community swore an oath to them. Now, I'm, I'm going to break down this section that we just read 
by showing you four things. Number one, what the, Gibeon, what the Gibeonites knew. Number two, what the Israelites saw. Number three, how the Israelites failed. And number four, how we failed. So let me begin with what these verses tell us about what the Gibeonites knew. And we're, we're first informed that when all the kings of Canaan heard the news about Jericho and Ai and what, they, what the nation of Israel did to those cities, formed a unified military alliance, a coalition to fight against Joshua and Israel. But as verses 3 and 17 says, the inhabitants of Gibeon, the inhabitants of the city of Gibeon and three other cities, Chapira, Biroth, and Kirjath Jerim, knew that they didn't stand a chance. They saw the futility of fighting against Israel and thought to themselves or had this mindset, if you can't beat them, join them. Now the Gibeonites they lived in Canaan, not far from the Israelite, Israelite camp, that Israelite camp Gilgal. And although they had a mighty army, they knew Israel's God had been fighting for Israel and they wouldn't stand a chance against them. The Gibeonites also knew Israel's distant history, how God worked wonders in Egypt to deliver Israel from a 400-year period of slavery and bondage. They knew at the end of that national incarceration, God delivered Israel by dividing the Red Sea so Israel could cross over to their freedom. And they heard how God fought for Israel to defeat the two Amorite kings, Og and uh, Sion, and their people during Israel's 40-year trek in the wilderness. They also knew Israel's recent history, how God had opened up the Jordan River so Israel could pass over to Canaan on dry ground. They were fully aware of Israel's God, how Israel's God had demolished the seemingly impregnable, impregnable walls of Jericho and had redeemed Israel from their initial loss at Ai by giving them victory over that city in their second military encounter. But what brought pressure, what really freaked out these Gibeonites and produced anxiety was that Israel had now come to their vicinity to do battle with them. And they were certain. They were certain that Israel's God would fight for Israel and win. There was no doubt about it. They knew it. So fearing this reality, they resorted to de deceptive measures, to a ruse. After learning of Israel's distant and recent history, the Gibeonites decided to withdraw from the Six Nation Confederacy, from that alliance or coalition formed, uh, that was formed to attack Joshua and Israel. The Gibeonites knew six or even six, uh, knew six or even 60 nations against the God uh, of Joshua, and they knew, he, they knew that they would suffer defeat. Again, they knew that Israel's God was an awesome God. Somehow the word had spread through the land that Israel's God, the God of all the earth, the creator of the universe, 
They knew that he is not limited by territories or borders. Rahab, the prostitute, knew and feared. And now the Gibeonites knew and feared. Somehow they heard, their hearts melted, and they devised a plan to integrate themselves into God's people. So now, having told you what the Gibeonites knew, now let me tell you what the Israelites saw. The Gibeonites, who were Hivites, they pulled off an Oscar-worthy performance in their theatrical debut. They took old sacks and loaded them on their donkeys. They carried tattered and torn wineskins, wore old and patched sandals, and dressed in old garments to make the Gibeonite ambassadors more convincing they brought dry and, you know, in all reality, moldy bread. And then try to be more convincing by saying, this bread of ours was warm. It was nice and warm and fluffy when we took it out from our houses as food on the day we came to see you. Those lies continued. And then... They pleaded for a covenant with Joshua and Israel in order to avoid a fight that they knew they could not win. Notice also that the Gibeonites were wise enough to divulge some of their knowledge of Israel's distant history. They talked about what God had done in delivering Israel from Egypt and making Israel's victorious victories over those two Amorite kings they made it, they, they knew about it, they mentioned it. So they, they, they knew they wanted to, to puff them up. But here's the thing. They knew if they revealed to Joshua and the elders their knowledge of Israel's recent history in Canaan, those victories in Ai and Jericho, they would blow their cover. And if Joshua and the elders found out that they were neighbors and not foreigners, then yeah, they would be immediately be put to death. So now this leads me to my next point, how the Israelites failed. Verse 14 records the greatest mistake the Israelite leadership made. And the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but did not seek the Lord's decision. Here's the thing, church. They trusted in their senses instead of consulting with the sovereign one. They had made that mistake the first time at Ai in trusting their senses. They trusted what they could see. He saw Ai, a much smaller city than Jericho, with fewer citizens and a smaller military force. This led them to ignore inquiring of God and to recommend to Joshua the taking of two or three thousand soldiers to fight against Ai instead of employing the entire military regime and presumably, and presumably wasting unnecessary manpower. They presumed uh, that. They lost that battle because they relied on what they could see and did not inquire of the Lord. Did not, they didn't seek him out. Again, they relied on what they could see and did not inquire of the Lord whom they could not see even though they had indeed seen God's provisions and his love for them demonstrated over and over and over again. How many times have you seen, you haven't seen God per se, you haven't seen him, you haven't touched him, but you have seen him bless you. You have felt the blessings, you have, you can think back and 
thought, oh my goodness, he was there when I was going through that or when I was doubting or he did. He showed me his power. He showed me how much of an awesome God he is. Again, he showed you, demonstrated his love for you over and over again. The Israelites had sought God's direction had Israelites the Is- or Israel sought God's direction this time, God could have revealed the deception to them. Had they gone to God first, I'm almost positive God would have told them, hey, don't believe those, don't believe those sneaky scammers. Don't trust them. George Santa, Santayana, the great philosopher, said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Israel failed in the first battle against Ai because they neglected to inquire of the Lord beforehand. And here, now they were neglecting to do so again. The nation of Israel would suffer because the leaders chose to rely on their senses. They forgot their distant and recent past. So do you see what I'm, what's going on here? What's, what I'm trying to say here with this? They, they sampled the provisions when they saw that cracked, moldy bread, when they saw the clothes, when they saw, you know, the wineskins, the cracked wineskins. They believed it. They tasted the provision. In other words, with their carnal eyes, they looked at the moldy and dry cracked bread. They smelled the staleness. They saw how cracked the sacks and wineskins were. They looked at, the, at their worn out clothes and sandals. They may have felt the dryness of the sacks and noticed the wineskins were empty and no longer supple. Yes, they may have even tasted the dry and stale bread. They may have done all that. But here's what we know for sure about what they didn't do. They didn't inquire of the Lord. Here's, here now, I want to mention this last point, how we fail. Oftentimes, many times, we fail in our Christian living because we're driven by our senses rather than inquiring of the Lord and discerning by his spirit. Do you know who the first person to do that was? In Genesis, Eve got into serious trouble because she saw that the fruit, she saw that the fruit was good for food. She proceeded to eat it and then gave it to her husband who also ate it. Folks, church, my fellow believer, my brother and sister in Christ, we must inquire of the Lord in spite of what we can discern with our sensory system, in spite of what we can see, taste, hear. We must inquire of the Lord in spite of that. The truth is this, feelings can deceive. Feelings can deceive. Sight can mislead. Many of you know that. Your feelings are your feelings, and yes, it's how you feel. But it's not always the truth. How many times have you felt you know what, I messed up. God doesn't love me anymore. How many times have you 
blown it and have told yourself, God will never forgive me. How many times have you, after a great spiritual high, you're now down in the valley. You told yourself, you know what, I'm such a mess, I'm a failure, I, I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve God's grace. I don't deserve God's mercy. I know I have, to be honest. In fact, this week, so many times, I felt like, I have, like I'm not worthy, that I'm a failure. But again, those are just my feelings. And I go back to the truth. When I go back to know what the truth is, what... I am now, as a born-again believer, as a follower of Christ, I am now a bona fide, adopted child of God. And He loves me regardless. He wants me to come to Him and ask for forgiveness when I'm convicted of sin. He wants me to obey like any good father wants of his child. But my feelings don't always align with the truth. And that's what I'm trying to say. Don't allow your feelings, what you're going through, to lie to you, to, to dictate your life. Always go back to the truth. We are having this conversation yesterday. Go back to, those, to that place. Be grounded. Where, they, where you're grounded, you can talk to yourself and remember the truths about who you are in God's eyes now when you became a born again believer. As believers, we must seek God who looks not on the outward appearance but rather on the heart. God looks beyond the visible and sees the invisible. So as we're beginning to see, Joshua chapter 9 urges believers to search their own heart. Do I seek God's guidance in the things that don't seem to really matter much? Do I seek his guidance in the big decisions? Do I, stop, do I stop to pursue him in emotional decisions? Do I seek his hand and not just his plan? When I lay out my five-year plan, my 10-year plan, my 20-year plan, do I seek his hand? Friends, the answer to all these inquiries, to all these questions, is a resounding yes. And everything, no matter how big, how small, how insignificant you think it is, come to the Lord. I get it. At times, you gotta make, have to make an instant decision, but still, you can still come to Him. You can still, Lord, give me the wisdom. Give me the wisdom to make the right decision here. And when there is time, when you do have the time, when you are given that time to think about your choice or your decision, go home, pray about it. Open up the word. Find out what he has to say. Hey, Lord, I just got this job at the strip club man it's gonna it's great income maybe making good money and protecting people and keeping things safe and making money putting food on my kids on a table for my kids but really what is that place what is that environment really going to do for your spiritual health for your spiritual well-being.
Bible's clear. Stay away from those areas. Stay away from those areas, gonna, especially if you have that weakness, especially if you're prone to sin in those areas. And I'm just using that as an example. I can use many others. But no matter how, it's a big one. Hey, Lord, I really care about this person. I don't know, should I, should I marry them? Before jumping on and, and buying that $10,000 ring and putting it on, come to the Lord and pray about it. Seek him out. Inquire of him. He'll tell you things like, are you unequally yoked? Are you, what kind of faith does she have? What kind of faith do you, uh, you have? Is it incompatible? Is, is she going to cause you to turn to other gods? Many times Christians will say, no, I'll make sure she comes to church and, you know, she'll come to the light and, you know, she'll understand, she'll get it, or he'll get it. Man, I've heard the, that story so many times. I've seen people try to do that so many times, and at the end, man, that relationship turns out to be disastrous. What kind of mental health does that person have? And are you willing to live with that for the rest of your life? Are you willing to make that commitment for the rest of your life? Is she or he willing to do the same? Seek him out in everything, no matter how big or small it is. And we also read in this passage that the Israelite uh, leaders entertained the possibility that the travelers just might share their zip code. You leaders knew that God had forbidden their making an alliance with any neighboring nation to avoid idolatrous infestation. Does that make sense? That God wanted them to destroy all those people living in their land because they knew if they, allowed, if they allowed them to live, their idols, their gods, they would, the Israelites would be attracted and they would be they would want that. They would, they would seek that out. So he didn't want any infestation of those idols there. And that's the reason why he told the Israelites to completely wipe those people out. However, there was no prohibition about forming a covenant with nations from a distant country. You can read that in Deuteronomy chapter 20. On, their, on the basis of their senses and sympathy, Joshua made a covenant with the Gibeonites to let them live. And then the leaders of Israel affirmed and confirmed the covenant. This covenant, like the one that two spies had made with Rahab, was apparently made in the name of the Lord. It was therefore irrevocable because it would negatively reflect on the reputation and character of God if it was broken. Thus, the covenant was ratified. This also brings me, when you make a, an oath, and one of the most important oaths you can make is an oath before God to love and to hold and to take care of the person you're marrying. You're making an oath to God. I mean, I understand that many of you probably weren't aware of that, didn't understand the importance or severity. I'll tell you the truth. When I made that covenant, when I married, when I said those vows to Robin, I didn't fully understand them. I knew what they were, and I repeated them. But I didn't understand them. 
I didn't really know. I wasn't given a good example at home. And so I just thought it were just words you just uttered. But it wasn't until I understood what it means to make an oath before God and before people. I was like, wow. And from that moment, I, that's when I decided, you know what, I'm going to, this is an oath and I'm going to keep it. Better or for worse, sickness and in health. I'm going to love this woman. I'm going to take care of this woman. Even when I don't like her, my feelings tell me I don't like her. I'm still going to take care of and love this woman because I made, I made an oath before God to, to take care of her, to be loyal to her. So again, the Israelites made an oath before God. It couldn't be broken. And so the covenant was ratified. And so this ought to show us that Satan attacks believers by coming to them in disguise as an angel of light. And if he does that, if we're told that he does that, and Scripture does say that, he do, that that's what he does. He comes uh, as, uh, as a dis, uh, in a disguise as an angel of light. It's important, therefore, it's important as a believer, as a Christian, to beware of Satan by being aware of his devices and schemes. Do you, can you sit here and really or sit there and really know what those schemes and devices are? What the devil does to, in order to confuse you, to deceive you? To, to tell you, did God really say? The same words he told Adam and Eve? To doubt God? To make God in your own image? To tell you, you know what? God doesn't mind if you put your hand in the cookie jar. He'll forgive you. He's a good God. I tell you, Satan, the devil, he's out to kill and destroy. Yes, as a believer, you may be saved. You may believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But if you don't understand the schemes of the devil, if you don't understand what he's trying to do to you, even as a believer, it's, you're going to have a heck of a time living this life as a believer. Again, he's going to want to destroy your relationships still. He's going to want to destroy anything that God has blessed you with, anything good in your life. He's going to make, he's going to want to turn you away from Jesus and to follow other things that are irrelevant, that don't even matter, that are nothing, that are just idols, that are just made up in your mind. He's going to want to tempt you with things that are going to destroy your mind, and your body. And to ultimately kill you. So many people out there that are secretly battling addictions, especially with prescription medication. Now again, I'm not talking to about anyone in particular. I'm not... I don't know what you have in your medicine cabinet. I don't know if you are dealing with that kind of an addiction. But if that pill, if that drug has a hold on you 
and is controlling your life. You can't, you're sitting here right now and you can't wait to go home and have that pill because it'll make you feel better. Then something is going on. That pill has control over you. And what does the Bible tell us? To be controlled by the Spirit. You can may, you may say, again, come up with all kinds of excuses. Well, if I don't take it, I'm going to die. The doctor says I need to have it. Okay, well, yeah, but does he know that you're, instead of popping one or two pills a day, you're popping ten pills a day? I heard, I heard this guy talking about how he used to pop 75 pills a day. Painkillers. Man. Talk about being hooked. Talk about being addicted. Satan will use those things to kill you, to destroy you, to ruin everything God has done in your life. Now you can't come back from it, and that can be part of your story, part of your testimony. Okay, let me remind you that for 10 long years, I fell away, I walked away from the Lord, I lived my life the way I wanted to live it. I didn't allow anyone to, or any one or anything, not even my wife, to dictate how I wanted to live my life. I was that much of a stubborn person. No one's going to tell me what to do. No one's going to tell me what to believe. And you know what? If I never, these words actually came out of my mouth. If I never, ever step into church or utter the name of Jesus, what are you going to do? What is it? What is it? Deep inside, I, I knew I couldn't do that. I, deep inside, I couldn't deny Jesus. But my pride was doing that to me, and it was destroying my relationship. It was destroying my marriage. And for a time, it did. Many, actually, a few times, I separated from my wife. Not once, not twice. Not three times, probably like four or five times because of my stubbornness. I try to find loopholes. I try to find exceptions. I try to justify my lifestyle. <clears throat> so for anyone to say, you know what, you don't understand, you don't get it, no. I may not be living your life, but I know what pride is. I know what addiction is. I know what being trying to, I know what it's like to try and to desensitize myself from that conviction. Yes, I believe deep inside in me, the Holy Spirit was there trying to convict me, but what did I keep doing? Kept drowning him out. More beer. More excesses. More things that felt good to my flesh. Sad. I was on a path to destruction. Well, I did. I'd reached the end of my rope and I had a choice to make and I chose Jesus. And what I'm saying is that you're not too late for that. As long as you have breath in your lungs, as long as you still have a heartbeat, you could still come to Jesus and ask him to forgive you. You can still come to Jesus and ask you to forgive you for your stubbornness, your pride, your idolatry, your addictions, and to heal you. He's always been there waiting to embrace you, to hug you, to, to hold you. He's just waiting on you to get up. Take hold of him. 
Now, let me also add this. It's interesting how believers feel bound by a covenant made by other humans, yet they ignore the solemnity of the covenant ratified by the blood of God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. The Son of God who carried his cross of wood to Calvary for the glory of God. Let me repeat that. The Son of God who carried his cross of wood to Calvary for the glory of God. That, my friends, enables us as believers through the Spirit of God to take up our crosses and follow Him in the service of God. Christian, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you sincerely prayed to receive Him and You must take that covenant serious or risk trampling the blood of Christ underfoot with the words, with their words, with your words and actions. Let me share with you what Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 says. How much worse punishment do you think one will deserve who has trampled on the Son of God who has regarded as profane the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and who has, insult, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. Don't let that be you, my friends. All right, now let me, let me move on and read the last half of this, this chapter. If you have your Bibles open, I'll be picking up in verse 16. Joshua chapter 9, verse 16. Three days after making the treaty with them, they heard that the Gibeonites were their neighbors living among them. So the Israelites set out and reached the Gibeonite cities on the third day. And reached the Gibeonite cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Chephira, Beeroth, and Kirith Jerim. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the community had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. And then the whole community grumbled against the leaders. Man, why did you make that oath? Why? All the leaders answered them, we have sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we cannot touch them. This is how we will treat them. We will let them live so that no wrath will fall on us because of the oath we swore to them. They also said, let them live. So the Gibeonites became woodcutters and water carriers for the whole community as the leaders had promised them. Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said to them, why did you deceive us by telling us you live far away from us when in fact you live among us? Therefore, you are cursed, and you will always be slaves, woodcutters, and water carriers for the house of my God. The Gibeonites answered him, It was clearly communicated to your servants that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land before you. We greatly feared for our lives because of you, and this is why we did this. Now we're in your hand. Do to us whatever you think is right. This is what Joshua did to them. He rescued them from the Israelites and did not kill them. On that day, he made them woodcutters and water carriers as they are today. For the community, for the community and for the Lord's altar at the place he would choose. Three days, church, three days after making that, at their that covenant was made. Joshua and the congregation heard that the Gibeonites were their neighbors. An Israelite embassy was sent to the Gibeonite cities. Joshua asked their leaders for the reason using the, the, the deceptive measures. Once again, they cited their knowledge of Israel's God. They admitted hearing 
Israel as God intended to make, uh, Israelite, uh, to make the Israelites permanent residents of Canaan by destroying the present occupants. They believed there was no other option available to them if they wanted to survive extermination. So they resorted to disguise and deception. In the face of the truth and what must have felt like impending doom, the Gibeonites pleaded. They pleaded for mercy from Joshua and from the leaders of Israel. However, Joshua and the leaders knew if they annulled the recent covenant, if they decided to ignore it, and they annulled that covenant made between the Israelites and the Gibeonites, God's name and reputation would be dishonored among the rest of the Canaanites. The wrath of God would subsequently fall on the Israelites. So Joshua and the leaders chose to honor the covenant and let the Gibeonites live. However, as we see, they relegated the Gibeonites to being woodcutters and water carriers for the sacrifices of the tabernacle, for the tabernacle and ultimately for the temple. Instead of being sacrificed, Gibeon participates in providing wood for the temple's sacrificial offerings. History, my friends, will show that this line of Gibeonites will even survive the 70-year Babylonian captivity and return to Jerusalem. You can read about that in Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 25. Apparently continuing in the temple service. Undoubtedly, by staying so close to the temple, by serving in the temple, the Gibeonites heard the Torah, heard the word of God, consistently heard it read, heard the prayers regularly offered, and the psalms continually sung, uh, the, uh, the psalms continuously being sung. Many of them were likely converted to the God of the Hebrews. This gives great hope for unbelievers we know, for unbelievers you know. If they, those unbelievers, can be kept near the church or brought to the church, even if it's only occasionally, there's hope that they will become devoted believers after hearing the gospel preached and the songs of praise being sung in the midst of worship, Amidst the worship of God by the people of God, there's hope. There's hope. That's why I always encourage you, just bring somebody. Bring a guest. Bring somebody you've been praying for. You don't have to make an argument. You don't have to fight with them. You don't have, just bring them. Allow the message of the gospel, allow the, the reading of God's word, convince them, to convince them. Just bring them, invite them. Friends, how great and how awesome is the grace of our God. The juxtaposition of lying sinners being saved while a sinless son who is the truth dies in our stead is the greater story. That is the greater story. This is a greater truth than what took place in the midst of the Gibeonites. The greater truth emerges from the one from the one who would go to Golgotha. The Gibeonites lied, and God looked beyond their fault and saw their need. It's not that God blessed their lie. Rather, God blessed his own name. See that? He didn't bless the lie. He didn't bless the sin. He blessed his own name. Jesus Jesus, who is one with the Father, 
is the truth. The Gibeonites lied and were blessed in spite of their lie. Jesus, who is the truth, told the truth and was sacrificed at the hands of sinners who could not recognize the truth. He said this. He said this in John chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. He told them the truth and was crucified in the hands of sinners who could not recognize the truth. Referring to his death and resurrection, he also said this. Jesus also said this in John chapter 2, verse 19. Destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. He said he would be crucified and he would be resurrected on the third day. No one else can make that claim. No other religious figure that's out there can ever make that claim. He said he was the son of God. He told the truth. And most liars couldn't stand to hear it. Now I say most liars because a lot of those liars were converted. But most of them, they couldn't stand the truth. This church is the reason, as believers, we must live worshipful worshipful lives in compliance with the costly covenant. The Son of God, who carried his cross of wood to Calvary for the glory of God, enables believers through the Spirit to take up their crosses and follow him in the service of God. Think about that again. I mentioned it already, but now think about it again. He enables you to take up your cross and follow him in the service of God. What cross are you carrying this morning? What is your cross? Whatever it is, I know it's heavy. We all have a cross to bear. I have my cross. Isaac has his. Everybody here has their own cross. But you know what? We're enabled to carry it. We're able to take up those crosses and follow him. And you know what else, else? You know what else is the truth? Is that you have your brothers and sisters that can bear some of that load. That care for you. I love you. I want to help you. It's okay to just hand it over just to better say, help me here. I'm tired. I can't. Take it, I can't. It's too difficult. Allow them to pray with you. Allow them to minister to you. Allow them to give you a sense of comfort and respite. Friends, truth was crucified on Friday, but he rose on Sunday morning. Amen. In his famous We Shall Overcome speech, Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. quoted the longtime editor of the New York Evening Post, William Cullen Bryant, by saying, Truth crushed to earth will rise again. So as I conclude here, now what we'll see by the end of this story is that the Gibeonite deception, those sneaky scammers, it actually resulted in redemptive implications. And again, this ought to show us how gracious God is. Here's what I mean. All believers, all believers at one time were Gibeonites. Before you came to Christ, you were a Gibeonite. Sinners with a determined destiny that would lead to destruction and hell. You had no merit. You had no understanding. You had no truth of your own to share. Even your reproach to the greater Joshua Jesus was faulty and flawed. 
what I mean by that, even your view, your thought of Jesus was faulty and flawed. But when that day came, came, when we accepted, knew our sinful condition, when we knew that we were in bondage to sin and death, we pleaded, we pleaded to him for mercy and not justice. You remember? Do you remember when you asked Jesus, sorry, Jesus, forgive me. And if it doesn't move you still to this day, if it doesn't still touch you to this day of when you ask Jesus for mercy, to forgive you of your sin, I'm asking you, go back to that place. Don't be afraid to go back to that place and experience that that time when you ask for mercy. And it will put things into perspective again. And you'll remember everything he did for you, the mercy that he showed you. Man, I was such a dirty, awful sinner. I was such an awful husband. I think I was an awful dad. I was an awful friend. The person you see now is completely different than the person you would have met maybe 15, 20 years ago. I did. And I rededicated my life. Man, Jesus, have mercy on me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. You know what he did. And he can do the same thing for you. But you have to recognize your fallen and sinful condition. You have to admit you're a sinner. No excuses. He doesn't want you to justify it. He doesn't want you to, you know. He just wants you to come to him and admit you're a sinner. Now, right now, We live by the grace of him who died as a ransom for our sins. His precious sinless blood paid the price that we could never pay. So we liars, backbiters, whoremongers, adulterers, thieves, manipulators, the unrepentant, yes, all sinners could have the chance to come to the table and eat. Jesus, the Son of God, who carried the cross of wood to Calvary for the glory of God, enables believers through the Spirit of God to take up their crosses and follow Him in the service of God. And because of this, because of this, we move from identifying with Gibeon to identifying with with Golgotha, the place where Jesus died. Time has run out here, and maybe some of you watching this or listening to this message or even here today, this morning, You come to that place. You come to that place where you're you're at a dead end. You've tried all these different things, all these different methods of trying to find peace with God, trying to find 
understanding, trying to find that relationship, trying to find that, that thing that's going to fill that hole in your heart. You realize nothing has worked. Nothing has been able to fill that void. The world has lied to you about so much and about so many things. So I'm asking you now today to try Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to the cross. Come to the cross and just hand it all over to him. Surrender it all to him and watch him. When you do that, watch him as he reshapes your life, as he transforms your life, as he, as he changes the way you think about this world, as he changes the way about how you see your relationships, but how you see forgiveness and mercy and grace, you will have a peace that passes all understanding. But you have to come to that place. You have to admit. Come to, that, come to the cross and admit, yeah, Jesus, I'm, you died for me. I'm an awful sinner. Your hands were nailed to that cross. Your feet was nailed to that cross. That crown of thorns was put on your head for me. sang a song earlier, and I imagine when I was going through that, I imagine, yes, I was the one who was coughing at him. I was the one that was, I imagine myself whipping him, torturing him, pulling his beard, the hairs from his beard out. But yet, when he hung on that cross, he looked down and said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Amen. What an amazing and beautiful God we have. So again, I, I want to give you an opportunity. I want to give everyone an opportunity right now that, to come to the cross and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, to be forgiven of your sins and be freed from the shackles of sin and death, to know for a fact, to know with 100% certainty you will live for all eternity in the kingdom of God. So if you're ready to do that, if you are sincerely ready to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to lead you in a prayer to do that. Now this is a prayer between you and Jesus. When you pray this, I want you to Imagine looking up at Jesus on the cross. We're having a conversation with Jesus who's right next to you and, and sincerely pray this. You can close your eyes and bow your head and pray this with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask, I sincerely ask for your forgiveness. I truly, right now, believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I completely repent of my sins. I turn away from them and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. Now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me and show me what it is to be a believer in this, in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you believe, if you prayed that, Sincerely, you're my brother and sister in Christ now. And God sees you now as an adopted child of God. 
co-equal, like, like you're, we're all, he doesn't see one Christian above another Christian, he sees us all as his children. So let us know about that, we want to hear your story, we want to hear how you prayed that, we want to help you in your next steps, maybe help you find a church in your area, wherever you're at, um, if you need a Bible, we can send one to you. Um, if you just need prayer, we can do that for you too. Reach out to us. I hope that you had a great, hope that you will have a great week. I hope that you will be blessed, that you will look at, you will find the, bless, the blessings of God in, throughout the week, throughout the day. Even when things are going horribly, that you will still see the glory and the blessings of God. Have a great week. I'll see you next time. Love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.